Have you ever wondered why certain plants do better in the winter months and certain plants do better in the summer months? The secret might be to do with the habitat of where these plants naturally grow and specifically the elevation. Let's dive into that information and find out how to best utilize that information to get the most amount of growth from our house plants. Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel, House Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So today I thought we'd dive into a topic that not a lot of videos, websites, lots of these places don't necessarily go into depth, and I will attempt to go into depth. I am not a scientist, I will say this again, but this is based on some of my own research and my own kind of experiences with the plants that I have in my space. And the topic is that of elevation. Elevation basically means how far from sea level certain plants might be growing, at least in this context. When we're talking about elevation in this video, we'll be talking about plants and how it can affect them, specifically the plants that we might be growing in our houses, in our collections as house plants. And it is just that essentially. So you could have something that's a low elevation kind of plant, which might be kind of very close to sea level. You can have an intermediate elevation, which is kind of like that one step up. And then you'd have the high elevation, which would mean most of these plants might be growing quite high up on kind of mountain ranges in cloud forests, all of these things. And essentially what I want us to kind of look at in this video is what that means in terms of how the plants are used to growing, because this is where they would grow naturally and what it means for us when we're trying to grow them in our house. And the reason why I wanted to dive into this topic, like most of you, or even some of you that might not know it yet, and you're watching this video, I've experienced certain differences when it comes to how some plants in my house and in my collection are growing when it comes to the summer months and the winter months. And this is gonna be the really important thing when we're looking at elevation. One of the important things, not the only thing, but it might give you some insight as to why some of your plants are acting a certain way during certain times of the year, and also what you can then do knowing some of this information to make sure that you're maximizing the growth of your plants, making sure that they are happy as possible, and making sure that they are kind of sizing up as much as possible if obviously that is something that you want to achieve. I do know there's quite a few of you out there that are quite happy to have very small and slow growing plants. That's absolutely fine, but this might be some information that you might find useful. So what is elevation when it comes to plant ecology specifically? And I'll give you some very extreme examples just to kind of really point out the differences basically. So think about it this way. So if you consider for a moment something that is from a low elevation, so quite close to kind of sea level, an example of that might be something like a Dracaena, formerly known as a Sansevieria or a snake plant. These plants generally will tend to grow at lower elevation levels. And it means if you think about where this might be growing naturally, if I'm not mistaken, this grows naturally around kind of Africa, basically. And I know certain parts of Africa can be quite mountainous, but this is one of the plants that will grow at lower elevations. So it means closer to the sea level. Areas where it's relatively flat, so quite close to the sea level, would be where this type of plant would grow. Conversely, a plant like the Anthurium rogulosum, which I've got here, and I'll show you up close so you can see what makes this plant quite unique, is that texture on the foliage, it almost has that kind of corrugated feel to it. And this would grow at a higher elevation. So this grows quite high up on the mountains. And that means different things in terms of what these plants might be used to. So that is something that you need to keep in mind. And the reason why it's something that's relatively important for you to keep at the back of your mind when you're looking at how your plants are growing is because you need to think about how the plants are used to growing, where they are quote unquote meant to grow. 
that's where their preferred growing region would be. That's where they would thrive. This means that you need to consider what elements are happening at these different elevation points. And we'll dive into it in a bit more in the video as well. But it will have an effect on how these plants experience things like light, things like humidity, and things like temperature. There's also another parameter that's always good to bear in mind, which is not just the elevation, but how far away from the equator it might be. So I'll give you a specific example of this. Say, for instance, you are looking at plants, two plants from high elevations, and you're looking at plants that are high elevation in Peru versus plants that are in high elevations in Colombia. There's a difference to how far each one of those regions tends to be from the equator. And this would mean that the climate would be slightly different. Even though they're both relatively high elevation areas, the temperature and the climate in those regions would be quite different. And specifically what I mean by that is the fluctuations between daytime temperatures and nighttime temperatures. So that is something that you need to remember because the closer you are to the equator, daytime temperatures and nighttime temperatures might not fluctuate that much. The further away you get from the equator, there is more of a likelihood that those daytime temperatures will be higher in relation to those nighttime temperatures. So again, something to remember. So let's dive into some kind of examples and the topic in general of high elevation plants. So I'll bring up an example of a plant <laughs> that people have seen a few times now on my channel and I'm still surprised that this is alive. Let's see if it survives the winter. But this is the Anthurium cuticuense. And it is the anthurium that it's not quite as obvious yet because it's quite a juvenile form-ish. It's starting to kind of look like it. You can see what the original leaves look like and they kind of change into something a bit more interesting as it matures. This is the one that tends to look a bit like chicken feet. <laughs> but this is from a high elevation region. And I say this is a difficult plant for a lot of people to grow and the high elevation is part of the big challenge that a lot of people will face with this because this plant, much like, and let me see if I've got another one that I can show you, much like this orchid, and I'll bring it in a bit closer so you might be able to see, this is the Dracula solii orchid. And this is essentially what a lot of people refer to as one of the monkey face orchids. So the bloom of this orchid, I still haven't got it to bloom, is one that when the blooms come through, they look a bit like monkey faces. Very, very cool. Very excited to see this bloom. Hopefully I might do it this year. But the reason why I say that these plants can kind of present their own set of challenges is, again, think about the fact that they're at high elevation. What this might mean is that the high, again, depending on how far away they are from the equator. So let's go for something that isn't that close to the equator, one that will have those fluctuations. But say they're at high elevation, they're a bit further away from the equator. What you will see, and you've probably experienced this if you've ever been up to the mountains somewhere, you might see relatively warm daytime temperatures, but then the nighttime temperatures will drop. So that is something that in an ideal world, a lot of plants that are used to growing in those environments would prefer to have. And I use those two plants as an example. And this, this is the reason why you need to kind of remember this as well, because what it means is both these plants need a nighttime temperature drop. They really, really do. So for instance, this plant might have struggled, both of these plants actually, do they don't do their best in the summertime, even in my space in a conservatory where I'm going here, because the problem is the nighttime temperature for these plants in the summer doesn't drop enough. Does that make sense? So a lot of the times when you see plants that might be more challenging and you might be going, why am I struggling to grow this plant? It might be because of their elevation and specifically because there might be high elevation plants. And a lot of the times this might be some of the trickier plants. So this is a plant that even Enid from NSE Tropicals 
has always said, even in her book, I loved reading her book and when she was making comments about this, she's just like, it will change and do what it wants and die in a heartbeat because the sun and the moon have risen in the wrong way. But again, Enid is growing in Florida, if I'm not mistaken. So the temperatures probably year round at night don't drop enough for this plant. And I think she even mentioned this in her book, like her region, she'd love to grow this, but her region isn't quite built for that. And this is the reality with both of these plants. So the reason why I showed you the kind of, and those little tendrils that you're seeing there, those are not roots. Those are the plant spikes of this specific orchid. And little tiny bit of extra information to you when you're looking at getting something like a monkey face orchid, they always, always encourage, and I don't know whether or not you can see quite how large the holes are in that net pot. You need to have this in something like damp sphagnum moss, and you need to have it in a wide hold, essentially net pot, because the flower spikes don't always go up, they might go down, basically. So if you've got this in a closed container, and you're just like, why is it never flowered? Your flower spikes might just be hitting the sides of the container on the inside and just not going anywhere and dying in the kind of growing media. So it's always a good idea to have those big, big holes, so you, the, the, essentially the plant spikes can come out of them. But all of this to say is that plants are very kind of, it's coded in their DNA, for lack of better words, as to where they perform their best. Does this mean that they would struggle and die entirely if you're not giving them those conditions? No. This is a plant that has never really got the nighttime temperature drops for the last three or four years. I also haven't had blooms ever since I've got it. So that might give you an indication. This is the furthest I've come in terms of flower spikes with this plant. So I've got high hopes. And this is a plant that I've got new in my collection. But I will show you an example of another plant that's from higher elevations and the difference. And that might be a bit more obvious to see. So you might be able to see the Anthurium rogulosum. And I will give you some very specific examples. Ignore the kind of slight rip in the leaves. This ripped as it was emerging. So this was one of the original leaves that came with when I first got this plant from Equigenera. So relatively sizable leaf. This was the next immediate leaf that I got. And this was kind of coming towards the end of spring. So there were still some and slightly lower nighttime temperatures. This leaf size and this leaf specifically happened in the summer. So it still produced a leaf in the summer, but let me show you, and hopefully this might make it more obvious if I stand a bit further back. This is still hardening off and this is a leaf that's still growing, basically. This leaf has grown now and I can tell you last night here, not in the conservatory, but outside, it dropped to zero degrees Celsius. And this plant is loving life. It's loving that drop in nighttime temperature. When I said it's not zero degrees in here, I am trying something new this winter where I'm trying to keep this space at as close as I possibly can to 15 to 16 degrees. I don't wanna go much lower than that. And that is because of the rest of the plants that I have in here, because not all of them are from high elevations, but I want to see if I can get more leaves and more large size leaves. Again, because this plant is reacting to an environment that's very similar to where it might be growing naturally. Now, the other element that I was talking about before when it came to elevation is you need to remember what else it might mean. So we talked about climate, we talked about temperature, we talked about the temperature fluctuations. You also need to be aware of kind of what else might be going on there. Is this just a plant that might be from a higher elevation or is this a plant that's from a higher elevation? I keep bringing this poor plant up for as an example, but from a higher elevation and a cloud forest, which basically means it needs the nighttime drop. It wants a slightly warmer temperature throughout the day, but it also wants an awful lot of humidity because if you think about what a kind of cloud forest might look like, and hopefully I've got a video I can show you here, essentially just think about an area that's pretty much in mist most of the time, which means that humidity level is almost at 100% all day long. So that is something that is kind of important to remember. So I've got a list and I'll talk you through them and hopefully if I've got some images, I will add them to the side here. But I'll talk you through a few plants that we might be aware of that we might have in our homes or in our collections or plants that we might want to get 
and where they would originally be from. And from there, you can kind of see, okay, what care do I need to give to these plants? So first one is an anthurium, and it's the anthurium vitae, the king anthurium. And my one's quite large at the moment. I cannot move that. I will put a picture here. But the anthurium vitae is native to, if I'm not mistaken yet, the cloud forests of Colombia. So again, remember what we were talking about before, it's going to likely have higher levels of humidity. Interestingly enough, in my experience, out of a lot of the anthuriums, that isn't one that desperately demands it. So it always is going to be a bit of trial and error and see how it goes in your space. The reality with that plant is my household environment isn't that dry. If you're maybe trying to grow that in a household environment and where you live is very arid and very dry and the average internal humidity of your house might be between 10 to 20 percent then it might struggle but and i've got like a list here because i'm never going to remember these numbers but it will grow at an elevation or it's found at an elevation of between 1200 to 1800 meters up or about four to six thousand feet above sea level basically and the temperatures for this plant would be daytime temperatures are averaging between 18 to 24 degrees or 64 to 75 Fahrenheit, with the nighttime temperature drop of down to 12 to 18 degrees Celsius, or 54 to 64 percent percent degrees Fahrenheit. So this is interesting. That's something that I think a lot of people might be surprised to realize that plant can take a temperature drop as low as 12 degrees Celsius. Now, am I telling you to keep those plants at 12 degrees Celsius of the night? Probably not. These plants, depending on how far away they are from their natural environment, and by that I mean how many times they've been grown commercially before they got to you, might mean that they're slightly more adapted. I know evolution doesn't work that quickly, so they are still going to want that kind of climate that they're used to from their natural habitat. So this is interesting to kind of keep in mind. Another one is another anthurium, and you might be able to see it behind me here, the queen anthurium. And this was mentioned by a lot of people in the review that I did of the queen anthurium. And if I haven't seen it, I'll link it at the top there. But this is a plant that also grows at relatively high elevation levels. So again, a plant that's native to Colombia, and the elevation level for this plant is between 1,000 to 2,000 meters above sea level, or between 3.2 thousand feet to 6.5 thousand feet above sea level. And again, another interesting one, daytime temperatures, 18 to 24 Celsius, 64 to 75 Fahrenheit, and nighttime temperatures around 12 to 18 degrees Celsius, 54 to 64 Fahrenheit. Again, this might be shocking to some people as well, because everybody's been always told that just that you need to make sure that your plants are really warm over the winter. Let's dive into the more intermediate elevation level plants and kind of what that might mean for those plants. And again, I've got a list and whatever plant I have got that I cannot show you, I will pick pictures or videos on the side. So this might be surprising to some people, Anthurium crystallinum. And the Anthurium crystallinum, commonly found between 300 and 900 meters above sea level, between 984 and 2953 thousand feet above sea level. And with this one, you've got daytime temperatures between 20 to 27, and then that's 68 to 81 Fahrenheit, and nighttime temperature drops from between 8, 16 to 20 degrees. Celsius 61 to 68 Fahrenheit. So you can see already both the daytime temperatures and the nighttime temperatures are higher than what we were looking at for the high elevation plants. And that is something that you're going to see as a common theme depending where the elevation is going to be because obviously think about it, where they are in terms of their height above sea level would mean that those temperatures are going to be different. Again, the caveat here is how far away they might be from the equator again. So you can imagine that even at the same elevation level, if you're closer to the equator, if there's not that much fluctuation between daytime and nighttime, those plants might need a more stable temperature between day and night to keep them happy. 
And the Crystallinum's natural habitat is kind of the rainforest in South America, specifically, if I'm not mistaken, kind of Panama region. So that is something to bear in mind. The other one is a plant that you might be able to see right here behind me. And I don't know whether or not I'm going to be able to move it too, too much. If not, I will add some pictures here because it's also growing behind the plant shelf. And that is the Philodendron melanochrysum. And the Philodendron melanochrysum is native to some of the rainforests in Colombia. Typical elevation for this plant is between 200 and 1,200 meters above sea level. 600 to 4,000 feet above sea level. And this is one that wants even higher temperatures during the day. So you're looking at between 22 and 28 degrees Celsius, 72 to 82 Fahrenheit, trusting list here, daytime temperatures. And then nighttime temperatures, you're looking at between 16 to 21 Celsius, 61 to 68 Fahrenheit. This kind of highlights a bit more what people might say that sometimes, you know what, my philodendron melanochrysum isn't doing very much. Why isn't doing it very much? Because everybody's kind of programmed at this point to think, oh, it's the growing season. It's the summer. This plant needs to be growing. Why is it not growing? It's struggling. I don't understand what I'm doing wrong. I'm doing everything right with the fertilizing and the light and all of these things. But they sometimes forget the temperature and the temperature change that the plant might need. A couple of honorable mentions here, so I don't want to sit here and list a whole bunch of plants for you, but other plants that are kind of within that same level of elevation would be the Alocasia miscalitiana, sometimes called the Frydeck. That's another one that's kind of from an intermediate elevation level. And if I'm not mistaken, that's kind of native to around the Philippines region, if I'm not mistaken. If somebody's from the Philippines and is watching this and I'm talking rubbish, let me know. And then a begonia as well here. So the begonia maculata. So the polka dot begonia, the cane begonia. This is another one that is kind of from an intermediate elevation level. So I think around Brazil, if I'm not mistaken, for that one. So again, these are plants that you might see if they get that temperature fluctuation, might be a bit more happy. So with these intermediate elevation levels, it's important to kind of make sure that you're ensuring some warmth and moderate levels of humidity to keep them at their happiest. And diving into some of the lower elevation plants. And I want to see if you'll spot the obvious kind of thing about these low elevation plants. And I will quickly rattle through them. I'm not going to give you a, 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 the elevation levels for a lot of these. You can dive into this a bit more yourselves. But Ficus elastica, so the rubber plant. Ficus elastica here. And then something like the Calathea orbifolia. And again, hopefully I'll find a picture and add one of my Calathea orbifolia pictures here. Then you've got things like the golden pothos. Then you've got the Dracaena marginata, another plant that we do see a lot in household environments. And then you've got things like the Sansevieria plants or the new, newly reclassified as Dracaena. I say newly, it's not that new anymore. But <laughs> for all of us that struggle to still call it a Dracaena and we still call it a Sansevieria, it's new still, it's fine. And I will give you an overarching thing. I'm kind of looking at temperatures here for most of these plants. So for most of these plants, you're looking at temperatures, daytime temperatures, usually above 22 to 24 degrees Celsius, upwards to 30 or over 30 degrees Celsius during the day. And the nighttime temperatures, you're looking at slight drops at night. So again, you'll be looking at day, nighttime temperatures of probably around 20 degrees or over. So did you spell the really obvious thing about the low elevation houseplants? Think about it, like the rubber plants, so the Ficus elastica, you've got the Sansevieria, you've got the Dracaena marginata, you've got the golden pothos. Anything common about these plants? And I just mentioned the word there. <laughs> they are all relatively common houseplants, which means, and this is the big takeaway here, is that these plants, and probably the reason why they were as common as they were, and the ones that they did the best, and then they became the popular and common house plants for as long as they did, is because those lower elevation temperatures and temperature drops at night, or lack thereof, only a slight fluctuation at night, makes them perfect for most household environments, because we like to generally keep our houses around that 20 degree mark, which means 
that these plants would be happy as well because they'd be seeing this they'd get a slight increase in the summer in the winter the heating might come up there's possibly not quite as high levels of humidity as you might get on the mid intermediate and high levels of elevation so again you can get away with just having them in the house somewhere it just makes sense that these would be the, the, the kind of common and the easy care, easy care, I know easy is not easy for everybody, but easy care plants that we've all known and been around for decades now, basically, probably even longer, actually. And part of the thing that was interesting about those intermediate and high elevation house plants was what happened last year with kind of a bit of the energy crisis and how expensive fuel and heating up everybody's houses were that i think a lot of people were truly surprised by a winter where they couldn't keep things as warm as they were used to in their household environments and they had some of these plants that i mentioned from the intermediate and the high elevation house plants and they were truly expecting these plants to perish really quickly because they are they're difficult plants, they didn't do that badly. Guess why? Because these plants, if it wasn't an energy crisis and you were heating your house up to a level where you can keep it comfortable for yourself at night as well, it's probably a bit too warm for some of these plants and they're not getting that nighttime shift down that they are used to and that they require. So that was an interesting thing that happened that people kind of realized quite quickly. And it's just like, but this plant, isn't just getting really miserable. It's kind of thriving and I wasn't expecting it. It's because ironically enough, that kind of socioeconomic situation that happened, and I think it's still happening in a lot of places actually, is creating more ideal conditions for those plants. Some tips or some suggestions that I might have based on what we just talked about now is if you know that you've got some of these plants that require a temperature drop, or actually, I'll take it even a step before that, if you know for a fact you cannot provide that nighttime temperature drop anywhere in your house for some of these plants, that needs to be a part of your deciding process or whether or not you're going to bring that plant in your house, especially if you're expecting huge things from it because it might never do that because you're not giving it what it needs, which might be that temperature drop as well. You might be doing everything else perfectly. The light might be perfect. The humidity might be perfect. The, the kind of nutrients in its growing media, all of these things might be perfect. And you're just like, why is this still not doing anything? Is it missing an element? And it might be something as simple as that temperature drop or the cloud, cloud forest level of it all in terms of the high humidity levels. All of these things need to kind of start playing a bit more of a role in your deciding factor when you're getting some of these plants. And again, I will sound like a broken record. Do some research if you can. Again, I'm saying this to myself. I never did this. But don't be me, basically. Try to be better than me. <laughs> do some initial research, especially for some of these plants that you might be looking at for a long period of time. You've got, if it's taking you months to find a plant that you can afford or want to get or find it available, you've got more than enough time during that period where you're searching for this plant to do some very basic Googling, basically, and just see where is it native to, what does it mean, what's its average temperatures at night and the day, and make that deciding factor, especially if you're going to be shelling out a lot of money. You're going to need to replicate that environment for that plant in order for it to be happy and in order for it to, for you to get the best growth possible. I know there's always going to be exceptions to the rule. Before anybody says so in the comment, I am aware. But by and large, going alongside what this plant is used to or these plants are used to in their natural environment will only be of benefit. So an example of this could be that if you've got a certain amount of high elevation plants that really need that temperature drop, can you dedicate a small area in your house? It might even be a room that you don't use very often where you maybe don't crack up the heating quite as much. Because remember, it's not just the nighttime temperatures that need to be lower. For some of the higher elevation plants, even the daytime temperature doesn't need to be quite as high, especially if you're looking at kind of winter months. So if you've got a room that's slightly chillier or maybe you can turn down the radiator a bit in that room, just make sure it doesn't drop too, too low at night. So that might be something that you need to monitor. And the reality is the high elevation house plants are going to be your more demanding and more prima donna-esque plants. I'm talking specifically to those people that want 
to engage with those plants and have those plants rather than the people that are just like, I don't want to deal with any of the prima donnas. You do you, you are probably looking at your intermediate and probably more the low elevation plants are going to be where you're probably going to be at your happiest. But the people that like a bit of a challenge, this might be something you might want to consider. And if you have enough of these plants that are used to kind of lower elevations, just put them all in the same room and let that room go slightly cooler than the rest of your house during the nighttime. And you might see a huge benefit to those plants. Conversely, if you've got loads of plants from low elevation kind of regions, then you need to remember that you need to keep that temperature stable. Those plants from the lower elevation will not do as well in something like a room that we were just talking about now for the high elevation ones where the temperature drops drastically at night. They will not like that because again, remember what we were talking about the low elevation, there isn't much of a fluctuation between daytime temperatures and nighttime temperatures. I will add a tiny bit extra to this and say, it's a good idea to have a mix of plants from all different regions, high elevation, intermediate elevation, and low elevation. And why do I say this? This is going to be for people that want to have that excitement year round. So let me give you, again, a very extreme example. But if you've got your low elevation house plants, they're going to do great in the growing season or what we call the growing season in the summer and they're going to really come into their own. But your high elevation house plants are probably not going to do very much. Think of this season as the higher elevations, not dormancy period, but kind of period where it's a bit like winter for them. It's not most ideal with conditions. But then come winter time where your low elevation house plants are probably not necessarily dormant, but again, they're in their kind of slow period they're not going to be doing very much. But if you've got some of your high elevation plants there, it gives you some interest even in the winter months for us because it's just like, oh, nothing is doing anything. But look, this plant is, it's, it's going crazy and it's growing and it's blooming and it's doing all these things. Yes, because it wants that. So actually having that mix of kind of high elevation, intermediate elevation and lower elevation, as long as you know and you can kind of give them what they need, will mean that year round, you'll have always got some plants that are gonna be thriving because those higher elevation plants, they're gonna thrive more in the wintry months. Those lower elevation plants are probably gonna thrive a bit more in the summer months because they're getting some of these things. I know light comes into play with this as well. I'm just talking about kind of temperature and humidity here. I am not talking about light levels. Light levels you might want to look at at that point is if you've got some of your high elevation plants and you're giving them that nighttime drop and you're giving them that slightly higher level of humidity, at that point you might need to look at do they need to be closer to windows, not too close so it doesn't get too cold, or do you then supplement some of the lighting with some artificial grow lights? So in terms of kind of like a conclusion to this video, and I know I've prattled on for quite a bit and hopefully I haven't lost all of you, but I do think that a lot of you appreciate some of these more informational videos and I do love making these as well it gives me like a chance to geek out and do research and kind of really dive in deep in some of these topics so some of the things that may be worth taking away from this video is do your research know what elevation your plant is coming from if you want to go that extra step further is know how far away it is from the equator or maybe you don't even need to do that as long as you're seeing say I know I'm getting a plant and it's going to be from Colombia, all I need to do, literally all I need to do is go online, do a Google search and say this plant, elevation level, natural habitat or something along those lines. And you should get some information. Some of it might not be the most accurate in the world, but at least it will give you a range basically. And then you might even be lucky enough, some of the information you might get, you might, it might say it grows in Colombia in this region of Colombia. And then all you need to do is Oh, it's that region. Google, new Google, and just go average yearly temperatures this region of Colombia and have a look and see what that means in terms of what it gets during the day, at night, what it gets in the summer, what it gets in the winter. And that shall tell you a bit more as well. You could take it a step further and you can look at average humidity in that region throughout the year or average light level in that region. Do you see what I mean? You see where this is going. It gives you a better chance of being able to give your plant what it needs. Now, as I said, not all plants are going to be that fussy. Generally, the higher elevation plants, I say they're fussy. They're probably not fussy. They just 
what what they want and they're used to being in that region basically it's a similar thing to and i'll bring it into the the kind of notion of pets and i've never owned this specific dog so if i am talking rubbish again and you own one of these dogs do let me know but it's the same thing as if i took a husky a siberian husky and i know this for a fact at least it is one of the breeds that is now banned or people are strongly discouraged from owning it in Cyprus. I'm not even saying Greece here. Cyprus, you're kind of looking, Cyprus is probably closer to Egyptian temperatures. Taking a dog that has been bred for kind of really, really cold conditions, and it's that's where it would do its best at, and putting it in somewhere that's like a desert and dry and hot year-round, those dogs struggle, and that's the reason why they really discourage you from having them in places like Cyprus, because it's it's kind of almost inhumane. Think about it that way, because we do this with pets, and we do this with animals, where you're just like, it's inhumane to take something that's used to that cold and put it in that much heat, or a, an animal that's used to this much heat and putting it in freezing cold temperatures, it's inhumane. I know we don't talk about plants in the same way, but if you do for a second, that might make things a bit clearer. It's just like, well, yeah, obviously this plant's not going to do well. It's used to that and I'm giving it this. Why would it do well? Conversely, same thing goes for the low elevation plants as well. So I know a lot of people that um, what me might be in kind of the northern parts of Europe or even Canada. And they're just like, oh, but everybody else is doing really well with this plant. But it really struggles in my environment. If you're getting those natural low, low nighttime temperatures, even with trying to keep your house warm in the winter months, it might mean that those lower, easier houseplants, lower elevation houseplants, are probably not going to do that well because they can't take that variance in temperature or variance in the humidity level. But you might be fortunate enough that the higher elevation plants might do better in your care. So always interesting to kind of think about it that way and think about what would work best in your environment. But give me your thoughts on this video down, down below in the comments. Did you know some of these things? Do you do some of these things? Do you kind of pamper some of these plants? I don't even consider it pampering. I'm just considering giving it what it needs to do its, to live its best life, essentially. What do you think? How, how have your experiences been with even some of the plants that I listed off earlier on? But yeah, Hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you had a great rest of the day. Thanks. Bye.